to start from a, a lighter a lighter point and, and build up to it because it's just such an emotional <laughs> train for me. So I want to start by, by sharing some items that I have been following this week and how this fits in. So the first thing I want to talk about is UNESCO. Now UNESCO, as you probably know, is um, uh, the UN's cultural body. And it is... Um, uh, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, it's a specialized agency of the UN aimed at, and I quote, promoting world peace and security through international cooperation in education, arts, science, and culture. So they have this thing, UNESCO, of recognizing things as uh, intangible cultural heritage. And there was a um, UNESCO conference in Morocco this past week so the first item that caught my eye that I thought was very wonderful is that the UNESCO decided that they are going to bestow um, this uh, concept of intangible cultural heritage on the French baguette. The piece of the bread? That's correct, Jim. That's correct. Don't, don't speak about it so uh, cavalierly. Uh, the, the, yes, that long, crusty loaf of bread, <laughs> I'm reading from a prepared statement, is a delicious staple of French life. It's been awarded, this is the concept of intangible cultural history and heritage, is that UNESCO awarded the baguette special protected status. Oh. Okay. Cl placing it in a culinary pantheon alongside other regional food delicacies from around the world. Okay, so this is, this is a, a UN body that, that recognized, and well, they should, the important status of the baguette. And it's now a protected species. Protected now, as in you, you can't, we can't eat it anymore? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> this, I, this I don't know. No one can threaten the baguette, I guess, with its extinction. But anyway, uh, I was pleased that, the, that uh, at the same conference, uh, and again, I, I want to start here because it becomes, uh, otherwise it was going to become too overwhelming to me and I'll be too choked up. So the next thing that they recognized as intangible cultural heritage was none other than Slivovitz brandy. <laughs> now, I don't know if you're familiar with Slivovitz, but it's a brandy with a, a Jewish, a Jewish history. Yeah. It's a plum brandy. And it also received UNESCO recognition, so uh, I, I suppose I shouldn't complain. It's actually associated with Passover by many Ashkenazi Jews, and the reason for that, of course, is because it is made from plums, and it and uh, and not um, any sort of grain. It's also much easier to deal with because it's not grape based. Make a long story short, um, it is. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't Jews who were, according to this article, leading the charge for special protected status of slip of its brandy, but the Serbs in Serbia, where it is actually a mainstay and also across much of the Balkans, Eastern and Central Europe. So, I don't know, have you ever tasted slip of its? I, I seem to have a hazy memory of a Shabbat morning <laughs> at a, uh, with a, a group of Chabadniks studying Torah. Uh -huh. I don't know people, if I should tell the story or not, but I mean, I, it, uh, anyway, the point is, is that we would go around the table and p someone would give a little Devar Torah, and then when they were through, we would make a L'chaim. Right. <laughs> so I think I tasted it So then. Slivovitz is very strong, very, very fiery. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's very, yeah. very fiery. Um, anyway, the, the, this particular article is really interesting. It says, it says, the spirit became particularly associated with Polish Jewry in the 19th century as Jews became prominent in the field of alcohol production and the running of inns and taverns. They found special utility in Slivovitz when it came to maintaining the Jewish laws around keeping kosher because, again, it's not made from grapes or from grain. But why is it between us that Jews became prominent in the, in the, in the field of alcohol production and running of inns and taverns? Do you know why? Because they were not allowed any, anything else. They were not allowed to own land. They were not allowed to be professionals. They were not allowed basically to do anything. And they were relegated yeah. to by the by the feudal, uh, the feudal chieftains and lords, and that in that feudal system of of that century in Poland, they were relegated to be the innkeepers on the, on the property of the, of the feudal chief. So yeah. In any event, good news for the baguette. 
and good news for Slivovitz. And good to see that at least one UN body is concerned with things of lasting importance. And again, um, traditions or living expressions inherited from our ancestors and passed on to our descendants known as intangible cultural heritage. I'm starting off with that. Because the other, okay. the other things that I have to share about the UN, I found very, very disturbing. Yeah, not surprising. Right. So first of all, um, there is um, another agency, the United Nations Human Rights Council, which is a body uh -oh. whose mission is to promote and protect human rights around the world. So last week, the United Nations Human Rights Council, Francesca Albanese, told Hamas and Jihad officials at a, a conference that they have the right to resist Israeli occupation. Right, so this is, this is her, she is an Italian lawyer. She, her official title is Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the Palestinian Territory operate, uh, Occupied Since 1967. And she basically said, the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and Gaza are what's left of historic Palestine. And therefore, Israel says that resistance is equatable to terror, but occupation calls for violence and creates violence. The Palestinians have no way to resist other than violence. So this United Nations operative is basically not only condoning, but encouraging violent uprising against Israel. And yet it's called a, a body whose, whose mandate is to promote and protect human rights around the world. Another aspect of this concept that I would like to touch upon today that it seems that human rights apply less and less to Jewish people in terms of the yeah. world's the world's view about this. So that right. I found I found very very um, startling. And then you bat, you bat, so the the whole idea about if about uh, Israel possibly uh, um, uh, considering blocking entry to this particular um, human rights uh, council representative because she is basically inciting to to violence against uh, against Israel, right? Yeah, she's endorsing it. Right. Yeah. So you balance that with another another item, which is that the United Nations General Assembly voted in favor of commemorating the Palestinian Nakba. Oh, the day of rage. The day well it's the it's the da, Nakba means I think um, disaster. And that the, is exactly, yeah, that, that yeah. is basically uh, Israel independence. Is, is considered um, the, the day of Nakba. So these pro-Palestinian uh, factors in the United Nations um, sponsored this resolution, basically lamenting Israel's birth. It passed yeah. 90 to 30, and it is basically this the Nakba is the, is the Palestinian term for Israel's establishment, right? So this is also quite uh, amazing that the United Nations is actually commemorating um, the the creation of Israel with an anti-Israel resolution, which is basically based on a call for Israel's destruction. Nakba basically is apparently is an Arabic word for catastrophe, and that's how the Palestinians recall what they call the displacement and dispossession that they experienced during Israel's war of independence of 1948. And what I want to share but, one but, more but thing, Jim. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I want to share one more thing because I, I I just want to be clear also why I. Why I brought up, I mean, I started with the Slivovitz and with, <laughs> with the baguette and with the Slivovitz just because I wanted to find some good thing to say about a United Nations body. So I said, oh, here, they're preserving the baguette for all time, and they even preserved the plum brandy as well in terms of, uh, what was it called again? In, uh, intangible uh, heritage uh, item. <laughs> but uh, the other things that I mentioned uh, about uh, basically Israel being on the... Um, uh, how do you say Kavanet? Uh, uh, on the on the scope, you know, like of the rifle of uh, of uh, the crosshairs. Yes, the crosshairs. The crosshairs. Thank hairs. you. Israel being on the crosshairs uh, and the United Nations basically being a, a, a device to, you know, to castigate Israel and to browbeat Israel and to keep Israel down and and which is which is the secret of the, of the Palestinian refugees after all of these years and why they still have refugee status is because they're basically a, 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 a plaything, a tool, a puppet that's being used by these forces to try to destroy Israel. But, you know, um, the, 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 um, the angst that I, that I feel that I was trying to share as far as, you know, like the, the human rights 
representative calling for basically for mm-hmm. for um inside you know incitings for for rebe- for you know armed to struggle against israel and and all of these kind of things it, it, it it's this incredible it's more than hypocrisy it's like this very demonic kind of of um mechanism that's in in place that's being fueled you know by by people like uh, that rapper and 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 by the whole mood that's being created about uh, yeah, again you you can't say anything anymore about about groups of people because that's the that's what's been adopted you know universally now but except when it comes to Jews it's a completely different set of rules 